I would like to introduce you to today's speaker, Olaf Jensen. Olaf is a friend of mine, and he's also an assistant professor of fishery science at the Institute of Marine and Coastal Sciences at Rutgers University. He studies um, threatened fish populations in Mexico and Mongolia. He also looks at comparisons of fishery management methods all over the world. His work on sustainable fisheries helps to identify well-managed fisheries that consumers can support with a clean conscience. And I know this is something that many people have a very strong interest in and we're excited to hear more about today. Um, Olaf went to Cornell University where he got his bachelor's degree in biology and society, one of the most fascinating degree programs I've ever heard of, and then his master's degree from the University of Maryland and the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory in Marine Science. Um, and then he stopped off in Washington for a year or so to be a Knauss Fellow in the Sea Grant Fellowship, um, the Marine Policy Fellowship, and that's in fact where I met Olaf. He worked in NOAA's biogeography program while he was a Knauss Fellow, and he then went on to do his PhD research at the University of Wisconsin Center for Limnology, followed by a postdoc, a David H. Smith Conservation Research Fellowship at the University of Washington. And I am very pleased to welcome him here today. Thank you all. Great, thank you Sunshine for the uh, introduction and also the invitation. And uh, thank you all for, for coming today to, uh, to hear about fisheries. I'd like to make two main points today. Um, the, the first is that managing fisheries is managing trade-offs. Uh, it, it seems obvious, but in, in many discussions about fisheries, we pretend that there are simple solutions, simply stopping fishing or reducing fishing drastically, uh, which is odd. We don't, we don't tend to treat other um, complex environmental issues in the same way. We rarely have discussions about climate change that say, we just need to turn off all the coal-fired coal power plants and we'll be fine. Um, so I, I want to get into some of the complexity of these trade-offs. Uh, the, the second point I want to, um, to talk about here is that, um, that fisheries are sort of entering the, the age of big data. Now, uh, with the recent news this week, big data has kind of ominous undertones. But what I mean here is that we're starting to develop uh, big databases on how fisheries are managed and the results of that management. And so we're, we're starting to be able to do what, what scientists like to call meta-analysis, which is drawing conclusions based not on anecdote, but on information from many different studies around the world, uh, studies of different fisheries around the world. So to set the stage, I think any, any conversation about resource management has to start with the nine billion people question, as the economist put it. We're, we're at a little over seven billion people now and projected to be nine billion people on Earth by 2050. How will we feed this many people? Um, the, the, the answer is all of the above, as, uh, as Obama likes to say about energy policy. Um, fisheries will certainly be part of that, although fishery, wild capture marine fisheries, which is what I'm going to talk about mostly today, are not likely to be a larger part of that equation than they are now. We're, we're probably maxed out on global fishery catch. So this is the, the trends in world fishery landings, the, the amount of fish that hits the dock. Uh, and you can see that they peaked back in the 1980s and have been roughly flat since then. And there's good um, theoretical reason to suspect that we're not likely to be able to get much more than that out of the world's oceans sustainably. So in, in, uh, back in 1969, a, a scientist and oceanographer, John Ryther, who uh, actually had his, his career right down the road here at uh, Woods Hole, um, he looked at, he did some real back of the envelope calculations about how productive different parts of the world's oceans are. And he came up with the conclusion that we're not likely to get much more than 100 million uh, tons annually out of the world's oceans, which isn't bad for a uh, prediction back in 1969, given that at, at that point it was about 60 million tons per year. Um, so so we're, uh, we have a global uh, increase in population, increasing demand for all sorts of food, including seafood, and the supply is limited and not likely to get any better. Okay, so that means that we're going to have trade-offs. So first of all, I'd like to go over what some of those trade-offs might be, the impacts of fishing. And to do that, if you'll bear with me for a, a few slides here, I'd like to talk about how hard we fish, the exploitation rate, versus what that results in, in terms of the catch and the impacts of that on the environment. So 
we all know that if you don't fish, you don't catch anything. It's equally obvious if you fish really hard and drive the population to extinction, over the long term you won't catch anything. And so fisheries management is about finding that sweet spot in the middle where the exploitation rate, how hard we're fishing, allows us to maximize the catch. That's called the, the maximum sustainable yield, to use the fisheries jargon. Okay, so if we're over here and we're fishing too hard, the trick is to reduce fishing. Um, if we're over here and we want to maximize yield or want to increase yield, we need to fish harder. Of course, that has impacts on the environment. You, you can't have your fish and eat them too. Um, biomass, the, the total weight of that fish population that you're harvesting goes down. Uh, if you're harvesting them, they're not out there in the ocean. So at, at zero fishing, we're up here at 100% of the, the possible biomass for that population, what you might think of as the, the carrying capacity. And the harder you fish, the more that population declines. And I think one of the things that, that has not been obvious to, to many of us as, as consumers is, uh, and, and people who are interested in environmental issues, is that at that maximum sustainable yield, there are drastic changes to the amount of fish out there in the environment. Typically, uh, harvesting fish populations for maximum sustainable yield, which has been the, the target, results in that fish population declining by 50 to 60 percent, sometimes more. That's considered a well-managed fishery in terms of sustainable harvest. So even well-managed fisheries have, have substantial impact on the environment. Uh, at the same time, you all know about the issue of bycatch, where some unintended species are also captured in the same nets or, uh, or hooks that target a, a different species. Uh, unintended bycatch often hits a species that have less capacity to be able to withstand harvest. And so the harder we fish, the larger the number of collapsed species. Um, so we used to think that this was the goal here, to, to maximize the, the harvest over the long term. More recently, we've decided, generally, both in the US and elsewhere, that the trade-offs are actually looking a little bit better if we back off a bit from that maximum sustainable yield. So fishery, fishery legislation in the US and in many other countries um, says that, that that maximum sustainable yield should really be a limit, and that, in fact, we should, we should aim to be a little bit further uh, back from that, where we get almost as much yield but the impacts to the environment are less. The, the impacts to the target species are less, and the impacts to bycatch species are also lower. So that, that's sort of the, the framework here. here. I think another uh, useful analogy is to think of fisheries as sort of a strange bank account, right? Think of it as a, maybe a trust fund where you want to, uh, you've got some principal here, P, and you've got some interest, and you want to be able to live off of the interest without reducing the principal over the long term. Um, and, and like uh, bank accounts, if the principal is small, the interest is small, okay? Just like a bank account so far. Un unfortunately, fisheries are more complex. When the principal is very high, close to that carrying capacity, the interest is also small. Uh, that, that's another way of, of stating that, that we need to be somewhere in the middle where that surplus production, as fisheries scientists call it, uh, or the interest is maximized at some intermediate stock size. Great. So, of course, all of that complexity is, is uh, generally lost in media coverage of the issue. Um, uh, headlines like Oceans of Nothing um, certainly don't hint at that kind of trade-off or complexity. Um, but we, we certainly can't, can't blame journalists alone. Uh, there, there have been scientific studies that, that are equally um, uh, doom and gloom, equally drastic about the, um, about the prospect of, of future fisheries. One of them came out in 2006, and, uh, and this group looked at catch data, so records of, of the fish that hit the dock, and they predicted, based on those records of catch, that collapse was imminent. In fact, many stocks had already collapsed, and if we extrapolate out this line, this, these lines of collapse here, uh, the simple message is all fish gone by 2048. Um, so so a, a number of other scientists uh, looked at this and said, wait a minute, you used catch data, so information on what fish hit the, hit the dock, not information on what's out there in the wild. And of course, the, the response is, well, we don't have that information globally. So if we, if we want to look at fisheries globally, that's the only data set available. And so the, the solution was for, for the, the scientists who wrote that original paper, as well as another bunch of their critics, to get together and try to develop the, the database that would allow us to answer those kinds of questions accurately.
Uh, it was a, a large effort, including scientists from, uh, from around the world, fisheries scientists, marine biologists, um, local scientists here, uh, Dr. Jeremy Colley at the University of Rhode Island was one of the group. I was part of the group. And what we did was to gather a global database of fish stock assessments. I'll talk more about those in a second. And, and use them, along with other sources of information, to try to really understand fishery status. And that was one of the first things that came out of that. Um, but, but having that global database on, on fish populations also allows us to test some of these common ideas that we have about fisheries, both as scientists and, uh, and consumers. So these are probably uh, familiar. The, the general idea about fisheries is that they're in bad shape and getting worse. Um, when, I, when I ask my students about this, I, I ask how many people think uh, fisheries are in good shape and there's no hands going up. And I ask whether it's getting better or getting worse. And al almost universally, people believe it's getting worse. Uh, there's this, also this idea about fishing down the food chain, um, th this idea that we start out with the larger, higher trophic level or high up in the food chain um, species. And we, we uh, drive them to extinction through overfishing, then, or we drive them to low levels. Then we move on to lower trophic levels, and eventually we'll all be eating jellyfish. So um, that, that's an idea that's out there. Uh, the, the correlate of that idea is that we can look at the, the trophic level, where, where the average trophic level is of the catch, and use that to say something about how fisheries are doing. Um, third, there's the idea that it, it, it's often too late, kind of a defeatist ad attitude that Many fish populations have been driven past the point of no return. Um, we often think of cod, for example, been, they've been down for so long they don't know which way is up. Um, the, the idea that it's too late for these stocks, um, that, that's another idea that's out there. And, and finally, the, the sum total of all of this is uh, going to a, a restaurant with a friend uh, a couple months ago uh, who's fairly knowledgeable about environmental issues and getting the menu and uh, having him say, I don't want to contribute to all these problems in the ocean. I'll have the steak rather than the fish. <laughs> so, so that brings up, again, the idea of trade-offs here. Um, so the idea that it's best to avoid eating fish entirely if you care about the environment. Now, these are, these are to some extent, uh, straw man arguments, right? But I think each of them can also be thought of as hypotheses that can be tested with data. We can, we can compare these ideas to scientific data on fisheries and see whether they generally hold up or not. So in order to do that, the, the group of scientists that I mentioned before uh, got together and scoured the internet, scoured our uh, contacts um, uh, with fishery agencies around the world, and put together what we call the RAM Legacy Stock Assessment Database. So this is the, the first global database of um, stock assessments. Stock assessments are mathematical models applied to fish populations, applied to data on fish populations to estimate their size and to, to look at those trade-offs that we looked at before. So the, the trawl survey that the uh, Metcalf Institute um, fellows went out on today, that's the kind of data that, that are used as the basis for stock assessments. We take that kind of data, we apply mathematical models, and we estimate what the shape of those trade-offs look like. We estimate how many fish are out there and how that compares to where we want to be. Um, so, so the RAM Legacy database is, uh, is open access. It's, it's available for, for scientists around the world to use uh, just by downloading off of the internet. And as I said, it, it, it's global in the sense that, um, that it includes all stock assessments that, that were available. Um, so the, the brighter colors here and more red indicate areas with, with more stock assessments. You can see we're in one of the most stock assessment rich regions of the world here. Um, the, the bluer colors indicate places where we don't have as many stock assessments. Looking at this and looking at the word global, you notice a, a bit of a mismatch. There, there are large parts of the world for which we simply don't have stock assessment data. So when, when, we, when we do analysis with, with the stock assessment database, um, we have to keep in mind that we're talking about the world's large developed commercial fisheries. We're, we're not talking about small artisanal fisheries uh, on coral reefs in Indonesia, for example, or, uh, or many of the other um, artisanal fisheries around the world. Um, we're talking about some of the, the best studied, best managed fisheries in the world. Okay, so uh, just to get uh, drive home the, the reason why we use stock assessments rather than this more widely available catch data. Um, I think the, the example of canary rockfish helps. Uh, canary rockfish is one of these uh, really long-lived uh, 
late age at maturity species, they, they mature at, at something like 30 years old, uh, and they can live much longer than that. Um, and, and so they're, they're obviously a species of concern for, for management. And if you just look at the, the time series of catch, you see the, the typical story, right? You know, they, they uh, had some, some fisheries back up until the 80s. They were bouncing around for a while in terms of the catch. Um, then the, the catch started to rapidly increase as fisheries developed. Uh, fishermen realized that this was a valuable resource. And that started a very rapid decline until they were basically not available to fishermen anymore. Okay, that, that's the story you might tell with catch data. Fortunately for rockfish, we know what actually happened from, from stock assessments. What actually happened is the first part of that story was right. Fisheries developed rapidly, they were largely uncontrolled, and the population started to decline. But what happened then in the mid-1990s was that management stepped in and said, wait a second, this is a, a stock that's heading, heading down the tubes. Um, and and they, they instituted a, uh, a number of different measures to curtail fishing. And that's what dropped the catch. So at the same time the, the catch was declining rapidly, the biomass was actually starting to increase because the, the fishing pressure had been reduced. So just an example of, of why this kind of stock assessment data is, uh, is exceptionally useful for answering questions about fishery status. Okay, so fishery status. Um, if we want to look at fishery status around the world, we can ask two questions. What is the biomass of those populations, the total weight of a population relative to that maximum sustainable yield? Here, that's that B current versus BMSY. So that's where we are relative to that, that trade-off. And we can also ask how hard we're fishing relative to that, that maximum sustainable yield fishing rate. That's here on the y-axis. So a, a stock that fell right here in the middle of those crosshairs would be one that was being managed perfectly for maximum sustainable yield and had kind of come to equilibrium. Of course, no real stock stays at equilibrium. These are wild fish populations. They fluctuate uh, for many reasons other than just fishing, right? But if it's kind of hovering around those crosshairs, we would consider that a, a well-managed fishery managed for, for, optimum, for maximum yield. Uh, these other quadrants, we can think of this one as sort of the emergency room, right? This one, the biomass is low. We're on this side of the, the, that, that, the, the graph. And we're still fishing them too hard. So these are fisheries that are in bad shape and likely to get worse. We can think of this uh, quadrant here as the recovery room. So these are fisheries that had been historically overfished. So in the past, the, the fishing rate was too intense. And that brought them down to low levels. But now the fishing mortality has been reduced as well. We're not hitting them so hard. So these are fish stocks that should be recovering. Um, th this is sort of the, uh, the, the happy place, at least from an environmental perspective, uh, where we're not fishing very hard and fish are very abundant. Um, of course, that raises the question of, so what else are people eating then, if we've decided that this fish, fish stock shouldn't be harvested very heavily? And finally, this quadrant I, I like to think of as the Wiley Coyote quadrant. Um, th this is sort of an unstable situation where the, we're fishing very hard, but they're still very abundant. It's kind of like Wiley Coyote after he's gone over the cliff and hasn't yet looked down. So this is unstable. We're not likely to see many fish populations in that quadrant for very long. They can sustain a high level of fishing for a short time, but pretty soon they're going to be, be heading to the left here. Okay, so that, that's, that's kind of how we might look at um, stock status around the world. Where do real populations fall out? Well, it's kind of all over the place, right? We've got, we've got good news and bad news here. The, the, uh, the good news, or the bad, let's start with the bad news. The bad news is that almost two-thirds of fish populations fall to the left here. They're below that BMSY. So their, their population size is low compared to where we would want it to be. That's the bad news. The good news is that for about two-thirds of fish populations, we're currently fishing them at levels that should result in recovery or should result in sustainable fisheries eventually. Um, so historically, things have been a lot worse. In, in most of these fisheries, we see them getting better. We can also zoom into particular regions of the world. And I think this is where, where a lot of us in the group were, were most surprised when we zoomed in to, uh, to different regions. The United States actually turns out to look pretty good here um, relative to some other parts of the world. 
quite a few stocks over here in this quadrant. You know, th there are still quite a few that are being, being overfished and quite a few that are below where we'd want them to be. Um, but, but by and large, looking better than other places. Uh, better than other places like Europe, which was quite surprising, I think, to many of us, where we, uh, we tend to think of Europe as an environmental leader in many respects, and, and certainly in many respects, like environmental conservation, um, uh, sorry, energy conservation, Europe is, is far ahead. Um, but in terms of fisheries, the, the bulk of the fish populations we looked at in Europe, the, the vast majority were below those levels where we would like to see them, and many of them were still being fished uh, very, very hard. Now, uh, um, uh, fishery scientists in Europe uh, have pointed out that this has changed a bit in the most recent couple of years. Um, so the situation may be getting better, uh, but it's too early to tell. New Zealand, uh, somewhat similar to the US in terms of having generally uh, fairly well-managed fisheries. Canada, an interesting situation. Uh, many of these are cod stocks uh, that, that collapsed in the, in the late 80s um, and have not yet recovered even though fishing rates are fairly low still. Well, so we can look at this situation through time as well in a few different regions. So if we look at the Northeast US, for example, um, just to orient you to the graph, the left-hand panel here is the exploitation rate, how hard we're fishing, and over here on the right is biomass, the, the total weight of the fish population. So if we look through time, compared to uh, where we would find over all species in the region, where we would expect that maximum sustainable yield to occur. That's here in light blue. And down here is how low the exploitation rates would have to be if we wanted to protect even the most sensitive uh, fish populations. So this is kind of a, an agglomeration of all the fish populations uh, in the region. And what we see is that the Northeast US had fishing mortality rates, exploitation rates, that were above even this multi-species maximum sustainable yield um, back up until as recently as, as the uh, early 1990s. A at that point, um, federal legislation got quite a bit stricter and dropped the, the fishing rates substantially, still not down to the levels where we would expect to see no populations collapsed, um, but, but quite a bit lower than, uh, than previously. And this has resulted in some recovery, although recovery has been, been fairly slow for many of these populations. Um, cod is a, is a particularly good example here. Uh, Eastern Bering Sea is an interesting situation. This is the, the area off of Alaska um, where fish productivity, the, the amount of uh, interest or surplus production on the, the fish populations every year is driven largely by environmental swings. So, so big environmental changes lead to drastic changes in how much fish can be harvested. And we see these, um, these reflected here in the exploitation rate and in the biomass. Um, but at, on, on average, the exploitation rate's being relatively low compared to that rate that results in maximum sustainable yield across all populations. So no, no obvious trends here. Uh, in contrast, the California current, which includes all the, the west coast of the U.S., uh, currently very low exploitation rates uh, compared to maximum sustainable yield and compared to um, uh, what, what it would take to, to have no species collapsed. So, so in California and, and other parts of the west coast, we're currently sacrificing quite a bit of possible yield in order to protect some of the most sensitive species. That, that's a trade-off. Uh, that trade-off has resulted in, in fairly strong recovery overall of, of many of these fish populations, back to the point that on average they're currently above that maximum sustainable yield level in the West Coast. Okay, so just to, to summarize this section here, the, the bad news globally is that about two-thirds of fish populations from industrialized countries are below their target population size. Uh, many populations are collapsed, what we think of as less than 10% of the unfished level and overfishing continues on nearly a third of stocks. The, the good news is that many regions, including the U.S., have, have really managed to get a handle on excess fishing pressure and have drastically reduced that fishing pressure. And we're starting to see recovery in, uh, in more than half of those overfished populations. Okay, so let, let's uh, move on to evaluating some of those, those uh, ideas that are part of the global fisheries crisis narrative. The, the, the first of those is the idea of fishing down the food web. Um, just to go over the theory here, the, the idea is that fisheries developed first on valuable top predators. Think of things like bluefin tuna, right? 
where uh, you, you get so much money for these things that people go out there and they fish them down until they're just gone. Uh, then once the top predators are depleted, fishermen move down the food web to less valuable, lower trophic level species. Uh, trophic level is just where they are in the food chain. So thus the, the mean trophic level, the average trophic level of the catch should be indicative of, of how badly we've messed up the ecosystem. That's actually an indicator that's been proposed for use uh, around the world, especially in places where we don't have good uh, stock assessment data. The, the recent facts um, from, from meta-analysis, from analyzing big data sets, however, suggest that all different parts of this idea are false. It, it, they're at least not general. They happen in some places, but they're not generally true. So let's start with the, the idea that the first fisheries to develop uh, were, were those for uh, valuable high trophic level species. Uh, fisheries are businesses, right? Fishermen make business decisions on, uh, based on the value. And so not surprisingly, um, the, the first fisheries to develop were those with the greatest value and those that were most accessible, nearest to shore. So uh, if, we, if we think back to when many of the fisheries developed, they developed near shore because that's what was accessible. That's what was at least uh, cheaply accessible. Um, and there, what's even more important here to the, this idea of fishing down the food web is that there's no relationship between trophic level and value. So I, I gave the example of bluefin tuna, which are the top of the food chain and just incredibly valuable. They, they sell for, for tens of thousands of dollars for, per individual. In, in some cases for the large one, even hundreds of thousands in, in exceptional cases. Um, so we, we think of bluefin tuna when we think of high value, high trophic level. In fact, there's just as many uh, cases of things like shrimp and oysters, which are at the bottom of the food chain and extremely valuable. Um, lobster is a, is a great local example, right? Uh, lobster pretty low down on the food chain um, and, and extremely valuable. Um, Okay, so in, in most cases, fisheries for lower trophic level species actually developed at the same time that there were, trophic, there were uh, fisheries for high trophic level species. So it wasn't that the high trophic level uh, fisheries collapsed and then we moved down. We moved down because there were more opportunities. And so as, as more, more opportunities became available, as more technology became available, as global population grew and demand grew, we started fishing through the food web. This idea that's been uh, popularized by, by a scientist, Tim Essington, out at University of Washington. Um, and, and finally, th there is no relationship between trends in trophic level of the catch and the status of fisheries. This was shown by uh, Trevor Branch, a scientist also using this database. Um, so and on all counts, this idea falls apart. And if we look at the, the end result using the database, what we can see is that the pattern, this is the same graph that I showed you before with the crosshairs, the pattern is very similar for low trophic level species, things like uh, herring, for example, uh, moderate trophic level species, and top predators. A trophic level is not a good predictor of status. So and unfortunately, there, there just are no shortcuts to doing the kind of hard work of stock assessment, the, the hard and expensive work of going out there and doing these long-term trawl surveys. Those are necessary if we really want to know about status. Okay, um, let's move on to the idea that for many fish populations, it's simply too late, um, that, that we've fished them too hard and too long for them ever to recover. They've gone past the point of no return. That, again, is a hypothesis that we can test by looking at data. So uh, very recently, we, we published a, a meta-analysis of fish stock recovery where we used the database to look at whether fish populations do recover, and if so, what determines how fast they recover. So we did what's called a, a survival analysis. This is a uh, analytical technique from medicine, actually. So uh, it, it uses, treats fisheries kind of like sick patients and asks, uh, what's the chances that they'll recover and how do those chances change um, it, based on different characteristics of the fishery? So our, our conclusions were that stocks can and do recover. There, there's uh, simply no evidence of a, a point of no return um, for, for fish populations. And not surprisingly, fishing pressure is the, the dominant uh, factor determining um, recovery time. The, the more we back off on fishing, the faster fish populations recover. It, it's, a, it's a fairly predictable relationship, although there's, there's always a lot of uncertainty when you're dealing with, uh, with nature and wild fish populations. 
Um, the, the, that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that of 62 currently depleted stocks, so stocks that are currently at less than half of their target size, uh, less than a quarter of them are now being fished at rates that will allow recovery. So for, for a lot of overfished populations, we're not yet taking the, the, the clear and necessary step to recover them. Uh, a lot of those uh, populations are actually in Western Europe. There's, mo most interestingly, I think, from this meta-analysis is that we found that, that uh, contrary to the idea that fish populations can adapt in ways that make them more vulnerable to fishing or environmental change, <coughs> what we found is that fisheries that had been exploited for a relatively long time at high but not extreme levels actually were able to recover faster than those that had been very quickly dropped to low levels. And this, this seems to suggest that there may be some capacity for fish populations to evolve characteristics that allow them to recover faster uh, after being, being moderately overexploited, which is good news because it, it means that, um, that the, the genetics is actually probably in most cases working with us as long as we're not pushing the, the fish populations too hard. Of course, the, 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 the individual details matter quite a bit, um, and the, the individual details of the fish biology matter. Uh, so we can look at three contrasting examples here. One of them is, is bluefin tuna. Um, bluefin tuna in the eastern Atlantic. As many of you know, bluefin tuna are kind of the, the poster child for overfishing. Um, fishing rates were dramatically too high for a long time, and the, the stocks were declining rapidly. Now, for the Eastern Atlantic bluefin tuna, um, fishing mortality rates have recently been dropped quite a bit, and we're starting to see the first signs of recovery. And what this analysis says is that for stocks with characteristics like bluefin tuna, we would expect to see recovery relatively rapidly, uh, either at no fishing, which is in green here, or at fishing at, uh, at MSY levels, maximum sustainable yield levels. Um, if we continue with the current fishing mortality rates, it's going to take a long time uh, before we see recovery. For um, things like cod that have more intermediate life history characteristics, uh, it's, it's a similar picture, but recovery is delayed substantially. And for things like Atlantic halibut, uh, which, which used to be fairly abundant in this region a long, long time ago, but have been, been depleted for so long that, that Nobody even remembers them being a big component of the ecosystem out here. For things like Atlantic halibut that were driven down to extremely low levels for a long time, we would expect to see very slow recovery. Uh, the, the, the situation of current fishing is not actually shown on here because there's a moratorium for Atlantic halibut. Okay, so getting back to our, our ideas, our common knowledge about fisheries, um, starting with this idea that they're in bad shape and getting worse. Uh, the, the idea of fishing down the food web, and this idea that it's, it's simply too late, we've, got, we've gone too far, and then finally the conclusion that it's best to avoid fish. I, I think we can, we can change a lot of these narratives, uh, in, some of them in subtle ways and some of them less subtly. They're often in bad shape, fisheries globally, um, but generally getting better in developed countries. Now, I, I, that's an important caveat to point out because as regulations get stricter in developed countries, one of the things we've seen, at least anecdotally, is that fishing pressure is moving to places with less strict regulations. So as Western Europe uh, has more depleted fisheries and, and the regulations are getting tighter, a lot of the, the Western European fishing fleets moving down to fish off of uh, West Africa, where there's, it's basically the Wild West, you know, very, very little regulation. Um, fishing fleets can have uh, access agreements negotiated that have all, all sorts of uh, terms on paper, but in practice there's no restrictions. They can go in there and, and mop them up. Um, so that, that's the, the, the caveat here for, for some of this good news, is that we're kind of pushing the problem elsewhere. Um, overfish species are vulnerable to collapse regardless of trophic level, and trophic level, in fact, is not a good indicator of vulnerability, and trophic level of the catch is not a good indicator of fishery status. As I said before, we need to do the hard work of scientific stock assessment. Uh, good news, most fish populations seem to retain their resilience. If we back off on fishing, most overfish stocks uh, show recovery. And, and finally, um, Best to choose your fish carefully if you think about, if you care about the environment, not to avoid fish entirely. Um, I, I don't have time to go into it, but there's a lot of work going on right now on uh, 
quantifying the environmental impact of different food choices. This is, is really interesting stuff because there are a number of different metrics, right? You can think about energy use of different food choices, uh, and fisheries are all over the board there. There are some really energy efficient ones and some that are terribly in inefficient. You can think about um, pollution. Uh, most wild capture fisheries actually look pretty good in terms of pollution because there's, uh, you don't need to use pesticides to raise them, for example. They're, they're out there in the wild. Um, so, but to boil it down to, to I think, uh, a fairly simple rule, in the U.S., buy American for, for supporting sustainable fisheries. I, I got to say, as a, a driver of a Japanese car and many other <laughs> non-American products, this, this kind of sticks in my craw a little bit, this idea of buy American. It sounds a little jingoistic. Um, but at the same time, for fisheries, it's absolutely true. We have some of the, the, the best and most strictly managed fisheries in the world in the U.S. At the same time, 91% of seafood that we consume in the U.S. is imported. So we, we could go a long way towards supporting uh, sustainable fisheries globally simply by supporting and, and buying um, food from those fisheries that are local and that are well managed. Um, finally, I, I just want to end on, um, on a, a, a couple slides here that, that illustrate a point that, that's often made. People often point out that, um, that fisheries are, are an invisible problem. Most of us aren't out there on the ocean every day, um, so we don't tend to see those those problems associated with fisheries. Uh, I think that's true for a lot of different kinds of food production. So this is a, an organic vegetable farm, sort of the, the environmental or, uh, ideal of, uh, of where we should be getting our food. This is actually Ray Hilborn's uh, organic vegetable farm. Uh, he's a, a famous fishery scientist, and uh, his, his family had a, a vegetable farm. This is the environmental ordeal, uh, ideal, but of course, this is what that area used to look like. This used to be temperate rainforest in, uh, in western Washington. It's simply that the, the environmental impacts of other food production are largely in the past or, or out of sight in areas that we're, we're not generally uh, going to on, on vacation. Um, so all of our choices about feeding people involve uh, trade-offs. And I think as, as consumers, uh, we need to be aware of those trade-offs. And as scientists, we need to, uh, to use data to really understand those trade-offs. Thank you very much.